watching us from. We are so glad to have you with us as we even come before the Lord in worship, in music and in song. Are you ready to praise the Lord? Yeah. Are you ready to praise the Lord? Yeah. Hallelujah. Amen. Move whatever you need to move. Get your groove on. And let's start this service. Come on. Put your hands together. Come on. One more time.
come before you, we just bring worship before you, King of all glory. And we ask that let every other name fade until there's only you. That every name, whatever it is, be it cancer, be it financial constraint, that all those names will fade away until we can only see you, oh God. We love you, Jesus. We exalt you, Lord. Oh, Lord. Hey. Oh, oh, oh yeah. Hands up, hearts open wide as the sky. We lift you high. We lift you high. God, we lift your name high. Hey, and God. place in every situation oh God 
Even in our families, we ask that you would take your rightful place at the center, oh God. We thank you, oh God. We lift you, we magnify you, we enthrone you, oh God. We glorify your name. We lift you and we exalt you. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Hallelujah. Wow, welcome Mabuno, wherever you're watching from across the world, whether you're watching from home or from the office or from the road somewhere, uh, it's great to have you here today. We're just worshiping the Lord. Wasn't that an amazing time of worship? Uh, it's so good that we can just gather every week as a family and just honor the Lord and bless Him and worship together. Some of you are watching with others and that's such a great thing. Some of you are watching at home, by the way. And if you're not watching from one of our gathered congregations and you're watching at your house or your office or wherever you are, we would love to acknowledge you. We would love to just know that you're watching with us. So hey, uh, what we're doing uh, in this season is we're asking you to just go on our website, uh, www.mavunochurch.org and that you would you actually find a little form over there that you can fill and it just tells us uh, that you're watching. It just tells us who's watching with you and it's a way for us also to just be able to make sure that we're giving you effective care and that we're acknowledging you uh, in, even as you watch. And so uh, please fill that out, whether you're watching on Switch TV or you're watching online, uh, just go to www.mavunochurch.org. You're actually seeing that URL on the web, uh, on the page right now, on the screen right now. And just uh, let us know uh, who's watching with you. Uh, just fill out that form. Hey, it's so good to see and we want to just actually go into a time when we worship God with our tithes and our offerings as we prepare our hearts as well for God's word. And we're going through a series, a very exciting series on intentional parenting called Modern Family. I don't know if you've been blessed just from the comments we've been receiving. We know many of you are just receiving God's revelation and wisdom. Uh, what a great time to be alive and to be learning from Pastor Carol. And uh, today as we prepare our hearts to give, uh, this is really interesting thought that struck me this week uh, as I prayed about this moment. And it is this, uh, how shaped are your children by your generosity? How shaped are your children by your generosity. There's a great scripture where the, the uh, prophet Moses uh, talked to the people of Israel and he taught them about how their, their lives should be impacting their children. It's Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 5 to 9 and I'm just going to read it for us uh, as we prepare to give. Uh, it says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. This is what Israel is meant to do. This is what God's people are meant to do. And then he says, take to heart these words I give you today. Repeat them to your children. Talk about them when you're at home or away, when you lie down or get up. Write them down and tie them around your wrist. Wear them as headbands as a reminder. Write them on the door frames of your house and on your gate. So what was Moses saying? He's basically saying, listen, your, your lifestyle should be such that your kids can actually see it. It's not just what you teach them because you should teach them about God. But much more than that, they should actually be able to look at you and to see your love of God from your life. So how shaped are your children by your generosity? Do you ever talk to them about why you give? Do you talk to them about why you tithe? Do you talk to them about why you're blessed, you bless your parents and why you bless the poor? Your children need to see this, uh, they need to hear it from you and they need to see it in your life. And so I want to speak a blessing over you as you model generosity to the next generation. Even for those of you who are not parents, uh, this is relevant for you because your nephews, your nieces, all the younger people that God has put into your life for you to disciple, uh, they're looking up to you as well and they need to see a model of intentional following of Jesus. So, hey, let me pray for us as we give. Father, I praise you for this church. I thank you for the generous givers, the people who have made this church what it is. I thank you because there are many here who love you and who are passionate about you, fearless influencers indeed. And Father God, I pray that you would help us to model faith to the next generation to model love of God to the next uh, generation, to model generosity to the next generation. I pray that you'd give us opportunities for our children to see us being generous, that they too in turn will be generous and be able to pass that on to their children as well. And I just want to pray for God's people as we give. Some of us are giving not because we have plenty, but even in our difficult times, we're giving out of faith because we are giving in obedience to your word. I pray that Lord, you would allow that there's no family that would give to your work that Lord would be left without. I pray that Father God, you'd allow that even as we give, that Father, you would allow us to experience the generosity of God himself. I pray for those who are praying for jobs, for those who are praying for new opportunities economically. I pray that Father God, you'd bless the work of your children's hands. And Father, we pray these things because we know that you hear us 
And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So God bless you. Can't wait to hear God's word. Hey, let's take notes, lean forward, because I believe God has something for every single one of us here. God bless Mobuna. Greetings, Mavuno. It's so great to have you here. My name is Pastor Carol Wanjao, and I'm one of the executive pastors here at Mavuno. I'm also trained as a marriage and family therapist. I've been married for 27 years and blessed with three children whom we love dearly. And you know what? I love being part of the Mavuno family. And wherever you're watching from, I'm so glad uh, that we can worship God together today. I mean, that's so amazing. And I'd also like to just make a very special welcome to all our first-time visitors. Uh, at Mavuno, we exist to turn ordinary people into fearless influencers of society. And we are glad that you can be with us today. And if you're looking for a, a church family here at Mavuno, we say, look no further. You're most welcome to join us. Uh, so today's sermon title is Raising Successful Children. And I want to start the sermon by sharing a story, an amazing story that I came across in Wikipedia that helps us smell, you know, what a successful family looks like. And this is the story of the Rothschild family who's, you know, patriarch, uh, you know, has been called the founder of international finance. Uh, it's a family that has dominated the banking industry. Forget this, 200 years you know, making them at one time the world's richest family. So the founder started off in a very humble beginnings as an orphan in the Jewish uh, ghetto in Frankfurt. And, you know, having started off as an apprentice in the banking world, Rothschild grew his business steadily to a, a tidy sum. Uh, but the family's fortunes changed significantly when he recognized the need for banking services in Europe. And that's when he sent his five sons, who are, you know, grown at the time, and he sent them to the major European capitals uh, of London, uh, Paris, uh, Vienna, Naples, and uh, Frankfurt. And with the sons' engagement, the businesses, you know, grew quite rapidly to the extent that during the late 19th and uh, early 20th century, the Rothschild family ran a dynasty that single-handedly dominated the world's banking sector, where they were now lending to governments and determining the world affairs of the time. I mean, imagine this, the power of a family when it is focused and united. And you know what? The success of this family has been attributed to the fact that they have learned how to pass on their family values and identity as bankers to each successive generation sending, you know, their more entrepreneurial children into frontier markets uh, just as the founder did. I mean, this is so amazing. And this strategy is actually captured in the family's coat of arms, which is based on Psalm 127. I mean, who does that? And Psalm 127 says, like arrows in the hands of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. And in this man lived this and he sent his children uh, and, and lived this psalm. I mean, it is incredible. Uh, if you look at their coat of arms, uh, the, the, the family motto is there, and uh, it reads Concordia Integritas Industria uh, in English, uh, unity, integrity, and industry. And these are the values that are central to this family. You know, I'd like for you to turn to the person you're seated next to and ask them, what is your strategy for your children? You know, what is your family's values, vision, and mission? It, this story is, to me, just so incredible. Now, for those of you who are joining us uh, this week uh, as, uh, you know, as visitors, I'd just like to recap from week one what, you know, we've been going uh, through. So from week one, uh, you know, in this sermon, we realized that uh, God's goal for parenting is that we should raise godly children. Uh, in that week, we, you know, we said that we may have lofty goals for you know, our children's lives, uh, for their careers, but God's goal is that we raise godly children primarily because children desperately need God. So that's what we said for the first week. Uh, in the second sermon, we talked about intentional parenting, and we examined the personal issues that we have as parents that prevent us from being as, you know, as present 
and as involved with our children. And we noted that to be an effective parent, we must deal with these issues. And you know what? We also said singles were not exempt from this exercise either. And we did say that if you're single and watching this someone series, then you are getting a jump start on parenting. And that is a fantastic thing that can happen to you. So if you haven't listened to these two sermons, and I suggest you do so, uh, uh, you know, because they have some important principles that you do not want to miss out. Uh, alternatively, if you found them helpful, please share the links with your friends whom you think will also benefit. So in today's sermon, we're talking about raising successful kids. And this is what we all want to do as parents. I mean, we do not want to raise mediocre kids. And we go to extraordinary lengths uh, to ensure this for our offspring. But how do we know when we have succeeded as parents? What are the key success indicators? You know, if you're to ask any parent this question, many will tell you that they have succeeded in their parenting venture when their children leave home, when they enter into a successful career, when they start families of their own and are financial, financially stable. Now, this is fair enough. I mean, it's a, it's a good working definition of success. And if a parent decided to work towards these goals, then their children will have a fair chance of winning in life. But what is the Bible's definition of success? And for this, I want us to look at some two verses. Now, the first one is Psalm 145 and verse 4. And this is what it says. One generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. Uh, Joel 1.3 says, Tell it to your children, and let your children tell it to their children, and their children to the next generation. So we can see that according to the Bible, parenting success is measured when our children are able to pass on what we have taught to their children, and their children to their children's children. And you see, God is not just interested in one generation. He's looking to raise successful generations through you. I mean, awesome, isn't it? You know, in the Bible, we read genealogies. And, you know, we read so-and-so begot this one. This one begot that one. That one begot the other one. And, and on and on it goes. But have you ever thought that God is doing the same thing through you, whether you're aware of it? or not. Now, the problem for us is, is that in this age of parenting, we have lost the art of thinking multi-generationally, and no wonder then we end up being a one-generation wonder. Now, we talked about this last week, but it bears repeating because of the gravity of the matter. And so this is how it typically works. You know, you have the first generation, the, this generation works very hard, they are so careful in their spending habits, saving more than they spend. And because of this, they manage to acquire significant wealth. Now, unfortunately, however, because of being so busy trying to provide for their families, this first generation raises consumer kids. You know, these are the kids whose desires are indulged on every side. You know, kids who are used to getting what they want, when they want it. Uh, kids who get away with behavior that was unacceptable in earlier generations. You know, kids who have a poor work ethic as they are used to everything being done for them. There's always someone to clean up after them. So this second generation becomes so used to being looked after that they never acquire their own wealth and neither do they leave home. Uh, in America, they are what is called boomerang kids. And boomerang children are defined as young adults or other, you know, adult children who have moved back in with their parents after living independently, often for economic reasons such as low wages, low savings, high debt, or unemployment. So that's boomerang. Uh, but in the UK, they, they, ha they have an amazing acronym. It's called KEEPERS. And it stands for Kids in Parents' Pockets Eroding Retirement Savings. I mean, ouch. You know, the Brits don't miss, mince their words. Uh, but what is common for both boomers and keepers is that they're still financially dependent on their parents 
even into their adult years. Listen to me. This is a very serious matter. It's not just happening out there, but here in our continent as well. All because parents have not yet determined their end game for parenting. And even if they have, you know, they have uh, uh, defined it too narrowly. And they have said all that kids need to do is to get good grades. Character does not matter. And they totally miss out on the biblical mandate of ensuring multi-generational successful parent. Anyway, the story continues. This boomerang or keepers give birth to the third generation. And these kids also acquire the value of consumerism. I mean, it's being passed on by their parents. And sadly, this third generation is often born into poverty, squandering any remaining wealth, if at all, and they have to start from scratch again. So the question is, how do we raise successful kids who in turn are able to pass on successfully what has been entrusted to them? And I believe the key is found in Proverbs 22 verse 6. And this is what it says. It says, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. You see, the Bible is all about training. It's all about teaching. Now, for some reason, the Bible has gotten a bad rap where it is said that it's, you know, it's old-fashioned. It cannot be depended upon to raise children in today's world. But this is far from the truth. The reason why the Bible talks about training is that once a child properly understands and lives out a biblical principle, when the principle is no longer theory, you know, they have tested it, and they know without a shadow of doubt that it actually works, then they have the tool and also the conviction to pass it on to the next generation. And this is what Proverbs 22 verse 6 is about. Again, it says, train up a child, not shout, not ignore them, not ignore undesirable behavior. Neither should you tell your children you should know. You should not ridicule or belittle them. But rather the Bible is saying, train them in the way they should go. And when they are old, they will not depart from it. And I do want us to remember this verse as parents because it is key to parenting. And if we do not get it right, then disciplining our children will turn disastrous and they can easily rebel. So this verse is so important uh, that if you have never memorized it, I want us to memorize it today. And I want, it to say, I want us to say it together. Proverbs 22, verse 6. Let's say it together wherever you are seated or wherever you are listening from. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Very good. It's about training. So how does one go about training a child? And I'm going to share some two practical ways in which we have sought to do this as a family. And I can testify that it has worked really well. So I want you to take out your notebooks. I want you to lean forward as these are truths that will radically change your family for the better. Are you ready? I hope so. So the first thing that you want to do is determine your values. Write that down. Determine your values. The first thing when it comes to training your child is to determine the values you want to develop in them. And there are many values that we can teach our children. But there's a great book we read called Ready for Responsibility by a guy called Bob Burns that really helped us determine the, the game or the, the, you know, the end game for our parenting. And as we read the book, it became very clear that we wanted to raise children who are godly, who are hardworking, who are leaders and good team players, and children who are marriable. <laughs> Some of you may ask why marriable. And it's because we value marriage, we value the idea of belonging to a good family, and we want this for, for our children. So that is why we want children who are marriable. So let me break down these values. The first one is godliness and service. We want to develop in our children a love for God, uh, for his church and for his work uh, because we are totally convinced without a shadow of doubt 
that the gift of eternal life is the best gift we can give our children above any other inheritance. And we also believe that serving in church helps keep our children accountable uh, towards godliness uh, and it also helps them develop confidence and leadership skills. I mean, it's amazing what volunteering in church does. And so we encourage our children to volunteer. We also send them to Christian camps so that they can be challenged by their peers to grow in their faith and also in their leadership. You know, for those of you who have never done that, I mean, Christian camps and church are just amazing places to develop that godly character and also leadership. So that is the first one, godly character. The second one is obedience and respect for parents. Now, this is an actual command in the Bible. And uh, it comes in Ephesians 6, verse 1 to 3. And this is what it says. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a blessing, so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Listen to me. God is uncompromising with the fact that he expects us to teach our children to obey and respect us. Now, this is not necessarily for the sake of the parents, although this is so important, but for the sake of the child. And this comes with a promise. It says that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on earth. So listen, there are blessings your children will forfeit because of lack of obeying you as a parent, and also lack of obeying other authority figures. This is how seriously God takes obedience. And you want your children, uh, to train your children uh, uh, to obey. You want your children to obey you. You want your children to obey other adults. And for this reason, we have tra trained our children to refer to other adults as Mr. and Miss. Even if they work in our home. It does not matter the rank of the person, as long as they are an adult, then we respect them. So that's the second one uh, of uh, obedience. Then the third value that we teach them is responsibility and hard work. We want to bring up hard-working children. And this means in our house, it is not the nanny's responsibility to pick up after our kids, as this would be training them to be sloppy and to always need somebody to clean up after them. It is, not, it is also not the nanny's responsibility to play with the children, especially when they were younger, and keep them entertained. Because this produces children who easily get bored, who cannot manage their time together uh, 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 alone, who need higher and higher forms of entertainment to keep them engaged. Instead, what we sought to do was to help our children engage with household chores. So that from an early age, they learned how to clear the table, they learned how to wash their plates as they're using them. And when they joined school, they learned how to wash their socks. They learned how to wash their little handkerchiefs. And they would do this after school. So today, our children wash their school clothes. They also cook for the family. And we want them to be easy and undemanding children who other people enjoy to be around. And by teaching our children about responsibility and hard work, we are actually raising them to become leaders. And we tell them as much. We tell them that as the Moravis, we are called to lead, which means we have to be responsible and we also have to be hardworking. So these are the values that we have taught our children. And they are not the only ones, but they are what we think are basic uh, and, and the ones that you know, all the others can be built on. And I do want to say that you can use these values to train even your special needs children especially as they grasp them, depending on their level of disability. We don't want to leave our you know, special needs children. They do have, you know, depending on their ability, they are able to grasp some of these, uh, you know, these values. So celebrating children as they live out these values adds to their sense of mastery and achievement, and it helps them feel good about themselves, which is such an important thing. But as you do all these things, I want us to remember our memory verse, and let's say it together. Proverbs 22, verse 6. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, 
He will not depart from it. So that's it. Those are your values. So having thought through your family values, the next thing you want to do is to determine a trading day. And here you're moving from theory to practice. Okay? And here's what you do. When you're determining a training day, you have, when you're thinking about training, you have to determine a training day and time. Uh, Deuteronomy verse, uh, chapter 6, verse 7 says, tells us, talk to your children about these things, that's your values, when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. So in other words, training children best occurs in natural settings. And uh, for us, we chose our daily devotion time and also our school ho holidays as the best training times, you know, with the children. And so what we did, you know, like from the time that they were young, we preferred to take an inexpensive vacation in a cottage or in an apartment as opposed to a hotel, as it provided us with the privacy and space that we needed to both bond with them and also train them. And this is the way it would work. Say, for example, we noticed that our children were taking a long time when called, um, we would take note of this and make it our agenda for our next vacation or our devotion time. And during these times, we would teach from scripture, you know, the importance of obedience because we wanted them to catch, you know, the biblical conviction. And then we would illustrate what we mean by enacting the, the, the desired behavior. So say, for example, we're talking about quick obedience. We would tell them quick obedience means stopping immediately what you are doing when you're called by your mommy and daddy and running towards us to find out what we want. We would then role play this principle, you know, and have children running from different parts of the house when they are called. And at this point, it was great fun. Remember, we are on vacation <laughs> or we are having devotions and we don't want it to be dull. We don't want it to sound like a chore. And so there would be lots of laughter. They would be high-fiving. Would, would be congratulating them for a job well done. And the kids would really feel good about themselves. And, and at the end of that vacation or devotion time, we would then explain that this is the way they should respond when they are called upon from now on. And, and we would agree on the consequences of failure to comply. And, and when a child forgot, as, as they inevitably would, we would very politely, no shouting, Remind them of the lesson we had taught them and administer the agreed upon chappers or spanking. Now, our kids knew beforehand the number of chappers or spanking that they would get. And one was for reminder. You know, uh, they have learned that lesson, but they have genuinely forgotten. Okay? Then two chappers uh, or spanks were for disobedience. As in, they are just disobeying. And then three was for defiance. And I can say for sure, the number of times we gave three chapas were very, very few. Why? It's because when you discipline consistently and clearly, then one chapa is often enough to dissuade further behavior. Now, I know there are parents and other schools of thought that are very uncomfortable with the idea of spanking as opposed to using other disciplinary methods. And it's with good reason. Because you see, spanking, you know, when it's done with anger, you know, you're just reaching out for your, the nearest flying missile, can be uh, very threatening to kids, and it can be tantamount to abuse. But as Christians, when we talk about dis disciplining our children, it's not about beating or punishing our children. It's about training and discipling them. It's coaching them. Um, which when done correctly, the Bible says, results in life and godly living. So that's our conviction when it comes you know, to spanking, when it is done well. So spanking works up until um, age 9 or 10. And um, usually in a family, there is that one child who is predisposed to spanking. There's one who's going to get a lot of spanking. And the other one, the very thought of it evokes, you know, evokes immediate obedience and so use of other discipline measures work just as effectively. And so as a parent, you really do need to use your discretion when it comes to disciplining your children. So, and incidentally, the training system I have described works for children as young as three years. We actually started with three-year-olds because they understand. 
And you can use this training and coaching method for training in other life skills, such as keeping a room tidy, uh, doing homework, being social, being a team player, sharing, you know, all these life values. Yeah, you can use these training methods that I have just talked about. As you do all this, let us remember Proverbs 22 verse 6. Let's say it together. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. So let's move on to the teens. Uh, during the teen years, you know, we don't. We, we don't chopper, we don't spunk. Uh, the training element, though, remains the same, where you explain from the Bible why that uh, behavior is sinful, and then you train and disciple them or coach them on how to change their behavior. So let's say... A teen is being antisocial, which is very common. Uh, they're in the house, they're being moody, they're preferring to stay by themselves in their room. You first start by finding out if there's something wrong. Uh, that's where to start. If there is, then help them understand that it is their responsibility to address the issue. You see, moodiness reflects a passive-aggressive way of dealing with an issue, which is not helpful at all. And, and here the teen is feeling that they have been offended, and that offense is stewing in them. And, and the question is, what is wrong with stewing? I stew some, from time to time. My team stews. Everyone stews. What is wrong with stewing and allowing an issue to brew in your spirit? Um, Ephesians 4, 26 to 27 gives us a, a, a reason why stewing is wrong. And this is what it says. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. So from this verse, it is clear that anger is not the issue. It is how we deal with it. Anger and unforgiveness gives the devil a foothold or an entryway into our lives, make, making keeping offenses, uh, anger, and bitterness a part of our character. And I'm sure you know adults who are this way. And you don't want this for your children. You don't want them to turn out this way. You don't want to become them to become that person who struggles with relationships because of being antisocial. You don't want them to struggle with their spouse because of being bitter and later on with their children. And so you want them, you want to train them to learn how to hang, uh, handle their anger, their pain, and disappointments in a godly way. So this is the way to train, you know, to help. Uh, to help your teen. And the first thing, help the teen identify their offense. Next, bring up the issue with the person. You're training them, okay, so what is the offense? This person has offended you. Okay, let us approach this person. Who has offended you? Now, <laughs> but we know in our African context, raising up an issue with a parent may or may not bring about the desired results. But the teen can talk to a trusted adult they can talk to a pastor. They can even talk to a relative. In fact, let me just give you a little hint. Once your child becomes a teen, identify with them, that trusted adult, uh, and give them the freedom to talk to them uh, and share whatever issues that they could be going through. This should be a person who you know, is then able to come back to you to give you an unbiased feedback of where you know, they feel your teen is and you know, the issues that the teen has with you, which you can then discuss with your teen or even the three of you, uh, you know, the teen, this adult, and yourself. Now, humbling, isn't it? I mean, you brought up this child into the world, now they think they know better than you. But imagine wisdom in this phase of parenting is getting that mediator who helps both you and your teen come to your senses. And for those of you who are parents of teens, you know what I mean. Things can go out of hand. <laughs> Emotions can fly all over. And we need, you know, just that person who will help us come back to us, your sense, our senses. Now, we, when we're training our teens, uh, you discipline them by also institute, instituting, you know, the privilege and reward system. So even as you're telling them about moodiness and so on, you still want to have a privilege and reward system. Uh, because you're not chaperoning. So, for example, make it a privilege to have their phone or to watch a certain movie or even to hang out with your friends. 
based on how responsible they are behaving or how much they are putting into effect the changes that you want to see in their lives. And honestly, guys, this is the way the world works. And your, the sooner your child learns that life has consequences, the better prepared they will be to live in the adult world. And the problem comes when we, as loving, well-intentioned parents, shield our kids from facing consequences. Then when they encounter the real world, it really throws them off. So these then are the ways in which we train and coach our children. And I want to bring this message to a close by raising a question. How have you been disciplining your children? Have you been training them? Have you been discipling them? Have you been coaching them on how to apply your values? And if you have not done these things, then I suggest to you three things uh, by way of summarizing this someone. Number one, adopt the values we have talked about and at least start there. You know, let me say that trying to determine your values can sometimes be a challenge. So start with the values that I have shared. It's a good place to start. And this is what we did with our mentors. We copied their value system, and it has worked very well for us. So, you know, adopt the values that I have talked about. The second, prioritize a training day. In the last couple of weeks, uh, you know, we've been saying prioritize time with your children. For some of you, talking to your children can be awkward, you know, as you do not know them. They do not know you either. So start by eating meals together. Start by assembling people and say, hey, guys, you know, let's, let's eat together. As you do so, find out how your children's day was. You can ask them their highs and their lows and also share with them uh, your highs and lows as well so that they begin to see you as a human being, you know, just like them. And then end by praying, you know, to God, uh, to help you in whatever all the issues that have come up uh, during that time. And here you're teaching by example. And you're showing your children that they can, and you're, you're showing them that they can come to God with their issues. And, you know, you do that as a family. That's the second thing. The third is start having devotions with your kids. Some of you may have passed, you know, this familiarization activity that I've talked about in point number two, and you're already good friends. And, and with your kids, I'm challenging you to do more. So add to your prayers devotions. Use age-appropriate Bibles. For those who are young, with young kids, you know, get uh, Bibles for young kids. If it's with teens, uh, they are now able to read regular adult bi uh, Bibles. So start maybe with the book of Matthew. Read a chapter. Say what you have learned. Have everyone else take turns just sharing what they have learned. And this is how simple devotions are. As parents, you are the key spiritual authority for your children. And your children need to hear your voice. They need to know your heart. And they need to understand your values. So do the devotions. Now, number four, get your children to volunteer. Now, there are those of you who, yes, you meet regularly. Yes, you're doing devotions. You also uh, do prayers with your kids. And I want you to up the game. And what I want you to do is to let your children look for uh, serving opportunities in church. As when they serve others, the values that you have been building in them get further reinforced. So have them praying, have them fasting, have them teaching others so that the, your children also grow in their personal convictions. As so as you do all these things, adopt the values we've talked about. Prioritize a training day. Start by having devotions with your kids or get your children to volunteer. Remember this, Proverbs 22 verse 6. Let's say it one more time. Train up a child in the way he should go and when he is old, he will not depart from it. So I want to end with a story that really blessed my heart. And this, this happened during the month of September. Pastor Moridi and I uh, have been hosting staff teams uh, from the different uh, Mavuno campuses. And as is the custom, you know, when the teams come in, you know, we started with introductions. So this one day, as we were going around, you know, we discovered that, you know, staff members have come, you know, from various other churches until we landed, I think, on some two or three guys who said that they came from Mavuno kids. And they are now serving uh, in church. In other words, 
They started off as kids being brought up by their parents to our Sunday school and they are now on staff as inter interns. My goodness. These are now, you know, children living out what their parents taught them. Amazing. And it made me wonder, what if as parents we took our mandate seriously and chose to prioritize our training and coaching of our children in the things we have talked about in this sermon? My goodness, what would they not become in life? What would they not be able to achieve? They would have God back himself, backing them up because they are living according to his will. They would truly be able to boldly and fearlessly address the issues ailing our country and continent. And they would be the change agents that would set our society on a different trajectory. They would be the fearless influencers that would make us proud. This is what our children stand to become if we do these things. And my prayer is that in our day, we shall see our children rise up to surpass us in their influence and that their children's children will do the same. Then we will know that we have been successful in raising our children. And I'd like us to pray. I'd like us to pray. And my prayer for you today is a very simple one. That you'll experience God's power, you'll experience His, His presence, and you'll experience God's joy as you take your rightful place as a spiritual authority in your children's lives. And you take seriously the mandate of training and coaching your children. Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your amazing word. We thank you that in your word, you have taught us that when it comes to our children, you are looking for uh, multi-generational success uh, as far as our parenting goes. We thank you that even you've even given us the tool and that you have shown us how to do that. You have taught us that we need to train and disciple or coach our children in the values that will give them life. We are so thankful, Jehovah God, that your word is true and that following your ways leads to successful children. We bless you, O oh God, for that. And we pray that even as we commit as parents to do these things, to prioritize our time with our children, to train them, to discipline them, to coach them, we are asking, Lord, according to your word, that then these children will be successful and that they will surpass us in their generation. And even for their children's children, they'll even be greater than the previous generation. So, Father, we bless you and we thank you for this time. For we pray these things in the name of Jesus. And God, God's people said, Amen and Amen. God bless you as you train your children. Yeah.